Robert Anders. Robert is uh, an expert HVAC en engineer, an expert at energy modeling. He's a partner with the firm of AHA Consulting Engineers in uh, Lexington, Mass. Today's format will be um, Bob presenting a uh, PowerPoint for the first part of the session about key issues for engineering and sustainability, and then we'll go into the uh, uh, 10 or 12 questions that uh, different members have submitted over the past month in anticipation of this call. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Bob and uh, thank him again for sharing his expertise with the Sustainability Practice Group. Well, thank you for inviting, Mark. I'm, I'm happy to be here. and, and uh, I appreciate the recognition. Um, if you want, uh, Matthew, why don't we go to the first slide. Um, I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind is, is what the point is when we're looking at LEED. Um, it, it, it sounds good. It, it is good. It, it, it's all wonderful and we can all, you know, gather around and hold hands to a certain extent. At least that's the perception of some of the owners that I've seen. Um, but really, there, there is an important point um, to the LEED program where we're trying to reduce the impact of our buildings on the local environment. We're trying to reduce the impact on the global environment. We're, we're trying to reduce the amount of water and, and energy and materials that the building is going to use. And at the same time, after we've done all those reductions, uh, we're, we're trying to make sure that the interior environment is appropriate and comfortable for the folks that uh, that are going to be using the building, in spite of all the reductions that we use. I'm sure a um, you know a, a yurt or a wiki up or a teepee, whichever you choose to call them, out on the prairie is reasonably sustainable in that there's lots of natural light, and natural ventilation. But it is a trifle cold and drafty in the winter time, and you know if it's not hooked up to power and, and light, it's tough to do work inside that uh, sort of structure. So. Anyway, what we're trying to do for the owners, as you can see, is add value. And, and owners will put a value on their building based on operating costs and uh, tenant occupancy percentage, or an inverse, the vacancy percentage. And so if we can reduce the operating costs and improve the employee conditions while we're reducing complaints, we can keep the tenants in the building and therefore that's what's improving and increasing the market value of the building for the owner. So how do we do that? And really it gets to, you know, we've all seen and heard the low-hanging fruit argument to the point where many of us potentially are a little sick of it. but. Really, you need to start with what are you going to do with your building, whether it's a renovation or a new building, regardless of whether it goes for LEED or not. And so uh, going to the next slide, Matthew, um, quick decisions that we can look at um, just when we start to talk about LEED, um, you know, the prerequisites, um, if you're not going to do the prerequisites, you may as well go home. But on the other side of the coin, the prerequisites are pretty straightforward in terms of how you approach the site when you're doing your construction, um, how much water you're going to use, how much energy you're going to use, and how you're going to go about setting up the building to be run in the future. Um, the, the site selection, sometimes we have input to what the site is going to be, but sometimes we don't. And sometimes um, an owner will bring us a building and for whatever reason, they've already got the site selected. Either they're, they're an expanding on an, an existing site, they've got a great price, um, you know, someone else is having a fire sale on a building for whatever reason, but the site selection will drive several of those very early uh, sustainable sites credits, um, specifically in terms of urban redevelopment and brownfield to a certain extent. Then uh, as we look at sealants and adhesives and paints and coatings and carpet, I think um, folks in the, in the specification industry can agree that um, when we first started looking at sustainability, the availability of these products in, in a way that met the sustainable criteria well, was fairly limited and those that did meet the criteria were costly and, and in the intervening time both the cost and the availability have, have improved. So. Uh, 
those have actually become much easier to obtain. They're much better quality. Um, I, I choose to think, I, I hope and pray, that the days of uh, choosing a lead compliant adhesive for mill work in order to hold a veneer onto a piece of non-urea formaldehyde board have, have, uh, have gone away and when they were to cause the non-urea formaldehyde board to delaminate. Uh, so that, that was an early choice in the project that I was involved with. It was either, do you, do you want your non-lead adhesive so that your board doesn't delaminate, or do you want something with low VOC? So, Bob, yes, that's, that's definitely true. And then most people don't have lead and non-lead lead specs. They've all uh, made the better choices, and all the manufacturers have now made those items practically commodities. Sure. Um, and in terms of water efficiency, sometimes um, the plumbing fixtures are easy choices. Um, also, depending on where your building is sited, that can have also a, uh, an impact on your water efficiency uh, calculations. And finally, the construction indoor air quality uh, is, a, is a common sense approach to construction that's, that's put forth by SMACNA, uh, the sheet metal uh, contractors organization. But it also, um, their program has OSHA implications. And their program, if you really wanted to stretch it, has liability implications. So it makes sense to control the dust and the moisture that's going on in your con construction site in order to prevent something from growing now during construction that's going to come back and create an indoor air quality problem later. On the other side of the coin, there are some tough nuts within the LEED program that either uh, don't make sense for, for your location or um, just pre create a, a whole new set of challenges. The, the alternative refueling stations that we used to have to consider um, uh, were extremely difficult in terms of either uh, regulations or uh, putting up infrastructure in order to, uh, to accommodate the credit. It's not every project that can accommodate a compressed natural gas refueling station. Um, these days, the, the credit is uh, relaxed to a certain extent in that um, we can provide preferred parking for the uh, low emitting fuel efficient vehicles. We don't necessarily have to have a, a refueling station. Um, in terms of wastewater reduction, again, I've, I've done projects that have on-site wastewater reduction, but it wasn't driven so much by the lead pr uh, process as it was driven by the project location and the amount of water that was going to be used. Uh, similarly, on-site renewable energy, while the technologies are getting less expensive compared to where they were, and regulation and, and rebate opportunities are becoming more plentiful, they are still um, something that is difficult to actually bring to bear on an average project unless you have a committed owner that is looking for that specific approach for their project. Right. Certified and wood. And, yep. and Bob, on that point, I think um, perhaps you'd agree a lot of the grants that were there for uh, from government agencies for for solar um, are gone. They they proved it worked, and now they're funding different things. Yes, what I'm finding is that um, there are now, uh, depending on your location, uh, installer resellers that will work out a deal by which uh, they will install the, the equipment and the appliances and either sell you the electricity or, um, and this one works more for nonprofits and for, for municipal organizations, they will install the equipment and, and give you the electricity, but they will take the tax credits and they will take the renewable energy credits and keep the tax credits and sell the renewable energy credits to utilities so that uh, there, there is a market, at least in Massachusetts, for the renewable energy credits. Um, I, I'm finding that while certified wood is easier to deal with in a commercial building, uh, and in fact many commercial buildings, you know, the first thing out of the mouth is, well, we're only going to have blocking on the roof and, and we might have a few wood doors, which makes the certified wood credit much simpler to document, 
Uh, when you get into residential projects, uh, specifically multifamily, the, the cabinetry that's involved in some of these projects can make certified wood a great challenge. You need to be able to find a, a cabinetry supplier that can present you with finished documentation on the cabinets. Otherwise, trying to gather all that information could become a, a very daunting task. Um, rapidly renewable materials, uh, also depending on whether you have a committed owner uh, or a committed interior designer, uh, those still are a bit of a challenge. There isn't a lot of market available for those. There are the odd product available, but um, when, when looking at uh, bamboo flooring, for example, uh, it, it's difficult to find a rapidly renewable bamboo flooring that's going to be harvested and extracted within 500 miles of your project unless you're doing something in Southeast Asia. Uh, and then uh, I'm still having trouble with the, uh, the harvested extracted within 500 miles. Um, now that could be partially because of the fact that uh, most but not all of my projects are in New England, so half of our 500 mile radius is Atlantic Ocean. But um, also, uh, depending on where you are in the country, uh, some materials are just not manufactured close by. So it is something to pay and attention to as, uh, as shop drawings are, are coming in and, and materials are being bought. Right, and so as, that, as uh, Bob is, um, although I know one firm in Boston asked Lead if we could count Europe and not count the water in between, they said no. <laughs> so, um, you know, they're just, you just, it's not like uh, getting a hundred on the test. You have to, you will only get the credits that are appropriate for your site. And we're seeing a couple projects now, as I've said before, that are not seeking the uh, regional credit or the renew or the um, uh, recycled content because really you always get it, um, but the paperwork is such a burden. So again, you have to decide what's right for your own project. So then. One of the things that LEED always likes us to do is start off the project with the charrette. And my experience is most of the owners and, and project managers and, and owners reps are going to walk into the charrette and the first thing out of their mouth is going to be, how much is this going to cost me? And a, a couple of times I've, I've had to encourage these people to, to back up a little bit and, and we're going to put the cost discussion at the end of the charrette so that so that we can consider trade-offs and and again it gets back to the low-hanging fruit discussion in that what is already in the project because of either the owner's program or the location of the project that is going to work within the confines of the lead program and a, a great um, a great example is that of that is a, is a project that I did on Massachusetts Avenue in Cambridge where uh, the owner was concerned about trying to save water but had no idea how to go about it. And then in the next sentence, the civil engineer said, well, we're going to have to put in a stormwater detention tank because of the fact that the stormwater infrastructure in this part of Cambridge is more than 100 years old and we can't be putting this amount of storm water into the drainage system which goes right into the Charles River um, and so we need to slow it down and, and introduce it gradually to the drainage system. Well once the tank was on the site it became a fairly straightforward matter to install a pump that would circulate and filter the, the sediment out of the tank and then pump the water up to the toilet rooms and flush the toilets and the urinals with it. At which point, instead of zero points in water efficiency, now, because we were also watering the, the limited amount of landscape on site, we now had six points for water efficiency. So, um, strictly speaking, the tank was not a lead cost, it was a site-driven cost. So, while I acknowledge the cost was still in the project, it, it's a case of how you look at the components that are going into each of the lead credits. So you need to you need to think about that in terms of what's already in. So then when we get into the charrette budget, like I said at the end of the charrette, 
you know, can, can we look at a cost-benefit ratio? Um, Matthew, can we go ahead, please? Thank you. Um, a cost-benefit ratio oftentimes helps with the, with the decision-making. Um, and again, it's important to think of how to quantify the benefits, but also how to quantify the costs, what really is an added cost in order to comply with the, the lead credit. While I acknowledge that captured water for most parts of the country has a fairly long uh, payback, depending on uh, what's needed and, and what is actually uh, has to be added from a lead standpoint, um, it can be presented in a, uh, in a slightly better way. So um, one, of the, one of the questions that we're going to get to when we get into the questions that are submitted is, uh, do I recommend that an engineer can serve as the lead project administrator? And if we can go to the next slide, please, Matthew. Um, my answer is, is resoundingly yes, but it's only because I do it. Um, I acknowledge that lead project administrator really needs to be a type of person not so much a training. Any sort of training in system design operation, um, so, so the architect, the civil engineer, even a, a property manager could function very well as a lead administrator. Uh, I, I don't necessarily think that one's training and background would, would make one a better candidate or would limit one from being a lead administrator, but let's take that a step further. If we look at lead for new construction and, the, and the, the discrete credit and prerequisite breakdown, you can see that, that for the most part the architect is responsible for the largest quantity of credits and prerequisites. And close second there is, is HVAC and then third is, is the site civil looking at the, the sustainable sites. But if we go to the next slide, which breaks down the points that are available, you can see that the HVAC engineer and the site civil engineer are both responsible for really more points than the architect. Now I'm taking a certain liberty here in that I'm assuming that HVAC is responsible for the vast majority of the energy model points. What we have to keep in mind is the system in the building that uses the most energy is the HVAC system, for the most part, unless we're talking about something that's intensive from a process standpoint, either manufacturing or data centers. Data centers are a whole different lead animal and really not something within the, the scope of this discussion. So um, the energy model for, for those of you who are less familiar with energy modeling, uh, requires that the building envelope be input into a computer program, and then the HVAC system is input, and then the lighting is input, and then the domestic hot water is input. Uh, the energy model needs to look at what the ASHRAE 90.1 energy standard calls regulated energy. And those are the systems that are covered by or within the scope of ASHRAE 90.1. And so uh, that includes envelope, HVAC, lighting, and uh, domestic hot water. Now further, you can take uh, some additional systems that are not really considered regulated. They're outside the scope of the standard, but they also have an impact on the energy that the building uses. And this can be either process energy in terms of a manufacturing process or the data center process or um, exhaust if uh, you've got either manufacturing or lab. Um, you can also include garage exhaust. And all of these approaches uh, have opportunities for energy savings. Similarly, uh, the building's elevators, if there are any, also are considered process exhaust. And so as long as you calculate it separately, you can take credit for a Gen 2 elevator that uses regenerative uh, technology to show energy savings. The, the one place where you're not allowed 
to claim any energy savings unless you really document it is in a building's uh, plug loads so that uh, if we're doing an office building that assumes one and a half watts per square foot for computer and desktop equipment loads, then we have to utilize uh, that number in both energy cases that we're comparing to demonstrate energy savings. The last point that we have to keep in mind is the lead requirement is that 25% of the uh, base building energy needs to be process energy. So we have, we're assuming that at least 25% of the energy that goes into the building is used in either the manufacturing process or the office process. And then we have to carry both that number to be the same in both cases. So there are some idiosyncrasies within the process. But anyway, that's, that's really my argument for the fact that it doesn't make any difference in my mind whether an engineer is lead project administrator or an architect is project administrator or then go down the line. Civil engineer, owner's rep, uh, even commissioning authority would, would be a fine lead administrator. So that being said, why don't we get into some of the questions? And I think we've, we've, just, um, we've just answered question number one. Um, uh, and just uh, in case you're wondering, I've been doing lead project administration for 10 years now. So the first project I started on was out in uh, Colorado in 2001. So, and Bob, I, I could, um, if I could interject because, sure. um, you know, as uh, specification writers, we've been involved in projects where you've been the lead administrator. And, and of course, the, uh, the process has run uh, uh, perfectly smoothly. It's, it's really about the attention to detail that the lead administrator has and whether, whether actually whether they've done it before. Um, certainly the lead AP credentials get you one level of expertise, but going through a project takes another. Uh, before we start the uh, questions, is it is it still true in the lead program that if a building does not have an HVAC system that you can't claim the savings? Uh, it okay. is true. It All is right, true. So and okay. uh, in fact, there, there's a further idiosyncrasy that says that um, uh, if your building has a heating system but no cooling system, um, you still need to include a cooling system in the energy model, which throws up a roadblock when we have clients come to us and say, I want to do a LEED certified warehouse. And, and we have to explain to them that energy modeling is going to be extremely difficult, and here's why. But um, okay, and so it's just what credits lead was set up to reward. Sure, and and initially lead was set up to address a build to suit office building. That was that was the original lead for new construction program. Now, obviously, there are other lead programs that have come out to, to address other building types or other project types. Uh, and, and lead has recognized the fact that you know, people want to apply a sustainability approach to their building, whatever their building is. So they're, they're trying to accommodate, and some building types are easier to accommodate than others. Um, in terms of other sustainable rating systems, uh, I, I am somewhat familiar with Green Globes. I'm not familiar with the CHIPS program. Um, um, Bob, I think that um, just for the purposes of the recording and people listening and later, maybe I'll uh, pose the question so it's if somebody doesn't have the screen in front of them and then um, you can respond. Is that okay? That's so fine. So question two is, are there other sustainable rating systems that your firm has experience with, such as CHIPS, Green Globes, or is LEED the main game in town? And, and my answer is, um, I have only worked with the LEED program. I've not been asked to address either the CHIPS program or, or Green Globes. Um, All right. No, and, no uh, slight to either program. That's uh, I just I've only been asked to deal with LEED. And other we see schools that are complying with CHIPS, and certainly California projects. Uh, Green Glo Green Globes is a fine program. We haven't had any owners who've requested it. So next question, Matt.
Do you recommend that, uh, Bob, do you recommend that LEED scorecards be issued in the spec? And if so, with credits marked as yes, maybe, and no? I absolutely do. Uh, the, the LEED scorecard is a, a concise and fast way to let the construction manager and, and the subs know um, A, that the project is seeking LEED certification, B, which credits they need to be aware of that are going to affect their own work, and uh, C, uh, to a certain extent, puts part of the burden of certification and ownership of the LEED program onto the construction team. So uh, yes, I think it's an important part of the project manual. Uh, we see that as well, especially when a substitution is uh, being evaluated. Um, substitutions always carry a big cost impact um, on the contractor, and they're going to want to know, why aren't you going to accept this substitution? And the answer is, um, you know, because it, it loses us a credit. Um, and actually, when the contractor sees the uh, lead requirements, sometimes they're actually a wonderful partner. They they prefer construction waste management. It keeps the corridors clean. People seem people projects where people steal trash, so the project uh, does better <laughs> on their credits. But I'm a little concerned about the maybe because maybe in a construction document to me as a spec writer is the same as no. Um, so generally, I, I encourage people just to say yes or no, because the designer should have determined which credits they were getting in the design phase, and the contractor questions are really based on what's in the document. So, but do you see a value in maybe? Um, sometimes. Uh, again, it depends on the, the project manager or the construction manager's approach to uh, the process. If we were going out to, uh, you know, a flat bid approach, then I, I absolutely agree with you. It needs to be yes or no. And in fact, you're better off having more yeses just to own them, just in case you can you can grab them later. Well, I guess that's a good point. Do you, if you had a an innovation credit because you were trying to get to 93 percent uh, construction waste management, maybe you could list that as a maybe because. You really want the contractor to hit 75, and you're not really going to penalize them if they don't get a little further. Sure. So, yeah, so I see your point. Uh, Matt, could we go to question four? And question four, are the current energy modeling requirements in LEED too detailed for most energy modelers or not detailed enough? I've, in other words, we've, we've heard that um, you have to understand how LEED wants their energy model, not how maybe ASHRAE wants it. Is well, it, it's, it's, it's not either or, it's A plus B. Um, okay. LEED actually puts additional energy modeling requirements on top of uh, ASHRAE 90.1. Uh, and, and in fact, the energy modeling requirements are uh, excruciatingly detailed. Um, to the point where uh, sometimes I find that they don't have real-world implications to what the developer uh, was going to do. For example, uh, in, in the Boston market, uh, as, you, as you make your way further out from, from downtown Boston, there, there's different uh, building standards in terms of systems in terms of power availability and, and in terms of lease. And so the, the lead energy modeling protocol in ASHRAE 90.1 has a certain base case requirement that is solely based on uh, building size and number of floors. And so in our market, it's certainly possible to have a 200 or 250,000 square foot office building that might be three or four stories high so that it, it's not a high rise, but uh, the building would be done with an air-cooled rooftop HVAC system that utilizes electric heat. And that was market standard for many years. And so uh, it would be nice to be able to use that as a base case to document energy savings off of for the owner's perspective where in uh, ASHRAE 90.1 and, and the LEED requirements, the, the system that must be used as a base case is 
uh, a chilled water air handling unit approach. And, and no developer putting up a core shell uh, office building is going to even consider chilled water because of the cost of premium to install it, especially if uh, the standard for the market is a triple net lease in which the tenant's paying all the operating costs. Similarly, uh, LEED requires that uh, when comparing two systems, the same fuel be used for base case and the proposed case. So if we're going to be using gas-fired hot water as a heating system, we must compare it to a gas-fired hot water heating system. We wouldn't be able to compare it to an electric heat system. Now, this is my own personal bias. Uh, however, it's entirely possible that some owners would want the electric heat and would be happy with the electric heat. And so using gas-fired hot water certainly uses less energy. Uh, it does have a cost premium to install. Uh, but because of the lead requirements, we're not allowed to use the electric heat as a base case for the, uh, the incremental savings. Now, I can understand that most of the requirements within the lead energy model are put there so that everyone playing on the same field using the same rules. So uh, it, it's a double-edged sword in terms of the, the detailed enough, but I, I feel that some of the restrictions are, are, are too restrictive I also feel that some others are, are, are not restrictive enough. But, well, that's, um, I think that's, that's a good point. Um, you know, you can get those innovation credits based on your zip code. Maybe um, someday they'll consider that for the systems as well. Uh, Matt, could we move on to the uh, next question? We actually have one from the audience that I'm going to sneak in here next. So I'm going okay. to get to that here. Uh, so this will be question 4.1 which um, I'll read here for you in case I know As sustainability codes um, become more the norm, how, what effect do you see this having on design teams, participants, liability, and how sustainable coordination will be addressed? By who, for what cost, et cetera? All right, well, I'm, um, I'm going to just take a 30-second answer at this, and then Bob, I'll, of course, um, I'd like you to answer that. I think that... Um, um, liability, whether a project is, is lead or not, whether you're using BIM or not, um, you know, the courts tend to put everybody in the same soup. And so if, you were, if um, you're doing a responsible job, um, I don't think that it uh, changes your, your liability um, uh, just because you're doing a sustainable a building. Architects have always had a responsibility to uh, design sustainably and and sure if you don't meet your your lead uh, prerequisite and and the owner can't get the rents or if you've got mold in your building well of course you're going to be sued because you sort of made a an effort or a promise but even in the AI standard documents um, the architect is really just making their best effort to achieve lead certification they can't guarantee it because they don't pick up a hammer and build the building it's a team effort um, Bob did you want to respond on this um, uh, my my approach is always that communication reduces liability, and so um, communication is a is a two way street. Uh, liability is is uh, created when when expectations and reality are not on the same page. Right, and you know you could make this the same case that you know when the ADA codes came out to that increase in architects liability and the answer on the one hand is yes because if your your toilet's the wrong distance from the wall you have to rip it out but no because there's no punitive it's just you know you didn't you didn't your building didn't meet codes so uh, or regulations so so fix it uh, Matt could we move on to five here we go it should be up there yep. not for you Right, LEED does not uh, not give MR credit contributions for MEP systems in an effort to prevent um, large and potentially inefficient mechanical solutions, um, material and resource credits. What other ways can the engineer aid in the building's final LEED point total? Um, 
Well, aside from what I've talked about already, and, and I, I don't necessarily know that the that the MR credit exclusion for MEP is necessarily to prevent large and potentially inefficient mechanical solutions, so much as it is to uh, encourage that, uh, that building materials be used in areas where recycled content is not so much the norm. Um, at, at this point, right. you know, I would, I would, I would agree. No one wants to buy a mechanical system because the, the casing has a uh, recycled content. The steel industry has always taken care of metal. It never goes ultimately to a scrap heap, and and so to ask those manufacturers to, to track that is, uh, and I agree with what you were, saying before. It's, it's not what Lead was after. It was, it was after materials where you know there are places where you lead can influence the market. Right. And that can pipe pipe and ductwork have, have always had a, a certainly a, a large component that's recycled material. Right. Uh, uh, next question, Matt. I want to make sure we get to uh, as many as we can. Um, so, Bob, what do you see if, you know, maybe what two or three credits do design firms go after um, just when they're just a few credits short of the next level of certification when you do, you know, when you're the lead administrator. What sure. Do you see and, there? And the, the, my, favorite, uh, my favorite one to put on the shelf and then go back and revisit late is, uh, is Green Power, um, EA Credit 6. My experience recently has been that uh, the Green Power, when, when purchasing a renewable energy certificate, is um, uh, remarkably cost effective for the fact that you can get a couple of points and, and write a check at the end of the day. Yeah, um, maybe for only four or five thousand dollars. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's you know it, it's down to about a tenth of a cent a kilowatt hour, and uh, it, it's very cost effective. A couple others that uh, need to be addressed a little earlier in the in the project would be uh, enhanced commissioning. Again, you know it, it is a check that needs to be written, but the premium for enhanced commissioning once you've already paid for the commissioning agent it just makes a certain amount of sense it's, it's usually you know 10 to 15 cents on the on the on the commissioning uh, you know 50 to 60 cents per square foot so uh, that, that's a that's a great investment uh, I also tend to look at uh, the in increased ventilation credit because uh, many times the local building code will require a quantity of ventilation air that uh, is in excess of ASHRAE 62.1 because of the fact that uh, they have not adopted ASHRAE 62.1 locally. So sometimes you're, you're almost at, at 20 to 25 percent beyond ASHRAE 62.1 just by following the local mechanical code. Wow. Okay, Matt, could we move to the next question? Um, Bob, how can you squeeze out those extra credits in the lead energy and atmosphere category? I mean, are you are you telling the architect to change the size of their windows? <laughs> uh, well, let, let's be perfectly perfectly clear there. I do not presume to tell an architect how to design their building. Um, I, I don't design, you know, attractive buildings. I can make suggestions on uh, material selection, and and generally, I find from energy modeling experience, windows are a a great opportunity to, to make an investment in the building. Um, windows are going to be there for a long time, and good windows purchased today uh, have have uh, excellent return on investment. Um, an HVAC system type, uh, notwithstanding the, the base case requirements of ASHRAE 90.1, uh, will also uh, be in this in the building for a long time and will dramatically impact. Uh, building operating costs for the life of the building, so it, it makes sense to look at, uh, you know, the system selection and uh, the uh, the approach with uh, with HVAC. Further, um, if you select your light fixtures and your lamps appropriately, um, sometimes there's an upcharge, but depending on where you are, again, sometimes there's a utility rebate that can be available to help you offset the cost of, uh, of an improved lighting system. So that's generally the three things that I look at right off the bat in order to improve the, uh, the, the, the points coming out of the... Uh... Oh, nice summary, Matthew. Um, 
So, next one. Well, just uh, just uh, to let me uh, follow up on, on that, we do see architects considering triple glazing more, and we do see projects where there's different glazing, um, different insulating lights on different facades of the building. So you really have the opportunity um, to deal with north versus south. Sure. And I, I've actually seen triple glazing used um, recently in our area, but only for acoustic purposes. Uh, generally, I see if you're going to if you're going to make a money decision between triple glazing or an improved low E coating, that um, the improved low E coating is, um, is is a bigger bang for your buck. And we're seeing people dropping the um, the uh, argon requirement um, in in uh, southern climates because it doesn't appear to be a uh, payback. Uh, but again, it depends on your particular project. So yes, could we move to the next question, Matt? Uh, what are the comparative costs of the energy and atmosphere credits? I, and uh, part of my problem when when I get any question that says what are the comparative any things, it, it's my first question is going to be compared to what? Um, but um, I find, as I said before, that um, money spent theoretically in pursuit of energy and atmosphere credit one. Um, is is an investment and that will have return because of the fact that uh, operating costs will be lower. Um, the comparative cost of uh, green power, just in terms of if you have to buy a credit, is is inexpensive. Um, costs for the measurement and verification credit. Uh, if you have a property manager or a building owner that's paying attention to to energy use as they should be, then the cost should be a no-brainer. Uh, it should be something that, that they're asking to have included in the project anyway. So that's my feeling. All right, thanks. And uh, we'll move on to the, the next question. We do have a few from the audience. Would we like to do them now? Um, sure. Or do we want, OK. Uh, so the first one I'm going to be putting up here in a second is going to be, um, are you aware of any sustainability standards for the design and manufacturing of major electrical equipment, such as traction power substations? Uh, I am not, but uh, I am not an exhaustive authority on the subject. So what trade association would that cumber? Is that IEEE or um, AEE? What, uh, I think if you go to the trade association for that, um, for that group, um, they'd probably have a technical leader that you could discuss that it, with. It, that, that one might be uh, an association of energy engineers rather than the illuminating engineers. Right. Uh, Matt, was there another? There are a few more here. Another one um, would be, um, I, I guess, kind of tailoring on, uh, tailoring on a question we previously had here, um, just more of a comment, I guess, maybe. Um, could or should a lead coordinator, uh, that would be a team of architects and engineers, um, so could you actually think of potentially having uh, your lead coordinator being a group potentially of maybe an architect engineer and an engineer? Have you ever seen that before in the past? Uh, do you think that's something that would be feasible? Uh, go ahead, Mark. Well, I mean, it's always a team effort, and one of the nice things about lead projects is you finally get to meet everybody for that initial meeting in one room instead of uh, the world of email. Um, but somebody has to be the registered lead administrator, and so that was that was really um, what we were talking about before. Eventually, you have to have one name and not one firm under under that uh, credit and. Um, but, but of course, it's a team effort. Yeah, I would. Um, I have tried to be a co-administrator with an architect in the past, and um, really need to kick the communication up uh, another notch when when doing that, just because of the fact that uh, if you if you have uh, uncommunicated expectations between the the two administrators, it can can lead to. Uh, misunderstandings and, and you know dropped balls. That being said, uh, just because someone is is the lead administrator doesn't mean that they know everything about 
uh, either the lead process or how to design the building or you know sustainability construction in general. Uh, the whole point of the process is to be collaborative and and to recognize the fact that everyone comes to the table with their own strengths and experiences and, and good and bad in terms of experiences with either you know a building type or a system approach or or you know a solution to a credit. So um, uh, it, it it must be a collaborative approach. Thank you, um, Mattery. Um, no, we we, we have uh, we have three more here. So the next one coming okay. up, um, a little bit off topic, but I think we can get the audience happy here in case we run out of time. Um, how elevator or escalator technology is addressed regarding lead credits is the question here. I guess uh, I don't, uh, how is would be the correct statement here. I don't know that escalator technology is it is considered as part of lead. I do know that elevator power use, as I said earlier, is is a process energy use, and it is possible to use uh, the the energy conservation measure uh, separated calculation approach in the energy model to address something like a Gen 2 regenerative uh, elevator as compared to a standard elevator. And if this and if this credit came from a, a product manufacturer, of course, uh, many of them are interested in well, how do my products earn lead credits? And you know, you get claims like someone who's got a brick in their hand saying it earns twenty eight credits. Um, to uh, people like uh, Mecco Shade, where the, uh, the their fabric is practically edible, um, but they don't get points for that, and that's okay. So if if you are a product manufacturer. Compare what you're doing to where you were before, and either your company is, as a company, using less water, or in, in uh, um, you know, look at what Walmart's doing. Uh, you have to admire how many millions of pounds of packaging uh, they're saving. But it, it has nothing to do with lead. It has to do with how are you making your own industry better, uh, more energy efficient. Um, next question, Matt. Well, can I um one, oh, sure. one further one further thought there? If there is an elevator escalator uh, manufacturer's representative on the line, um, re really, what would be very helpful would be a comparison of your product to a standard product that you know you you're you're, you're selling something that's value added. Um, so certainly, in terms of energy used, uh, documentation of of you know, product A versus your product would be hugely helpful for the, the folks that have to run an energy model. Thank you. And we have question 8.4 here loading up. Um, have there been revisions to date with provisions for effective inclusion of fuel cell or other federal, uh, of fuel cell other than federal grants? Uh, again, I have to confess to uh, to, to not being up to date on uh, that sort of thing. We've, we've had a couple of projects consider fuel cells, but it hasn't gone much beyond that. All right, and the, I know uh, in the Boston area, the Cape Cod Community College uh, was able to put in a fuel, a fuel cell, and they got a, a state grant um, as well as a federal grant, and that enabled them. I think the cost was... Uh, well, I don't know what the cost of the whole system was, but it was it was substantial. But they also used it for teaching, so they um, uh, it, they got uh, they were able to to dip into a um, a different pot. It's unfortunate on the news today that our our new our new national budget has um, uh, reduced the funding for car fuel cells, but uh, manu car manufacturers, of course, are still making them. So I'm. I think we're all hopeful that all types of energy efficient uh, technology moves forward. Um, Matt, can we move to the next? We actually had a response with the conversation we were just having here saying that uh, um, I'm not sure if it, I think it's supposed to be um, LE, I think it's supposed to be LEED, but he has it as LEDD only in power management automation, VFDs, load sharing, occupied oper and operate. Sorry, occupied operation people and people movers are inclusive into a project dependent upon cell lead certifications. 
Um, so I'm not sure. What, was the, word, what was the word before lead certification there at the end? STEL, S-T-E-L-L. -L. So I'm not sure if that was supposed no, to be. I mean, be I've seen different. escalators that stop when no one's on them, okay. if that's what they're referring to. But, um, Bob, do you have a response to that? Um, uh, unfortunately, no. I, I don't. I think uh, an escalator that stopped until someone got on it would be would be an interesting sort of thing. But uh, well, it sees someone coming and then starts up because you can't be on a stationary stair and have it move. It would tip you over backwards every time. But sure. um, I, I've seen them in um, in major malls where they're um, at convention centers. I think the DC convention center may have that. Okay, next question. We've got a. a yep, and this is minutes. the last one from the audience currently. As it loads on the screen here, uh, what are the mandates currently for new product certifications such as solar nanofilm uh, generation glazing? Does anyone have an answer to that? Well, I think individual industries are going to move forward. Um, the ASTM process is uh, is very rigorous but very transparent so that um, standards can be developed. Those standards could be included in building codes. Um, uh, when it when it comes to the the lead program, um, lead is um, piloting, testing uh, about 20 new credits, um, they for the 2013 version. So you would probably um, uh, look to the um, the lead committee that's dealing with your particular product. Um, I I don't see um, lead. Um, you know, uh, nanotechnology um, may not increase the building performance, that sort of magic 5%, so that it, it would move you from one um, uh, credit to, to achieve another. Um, it's certainly an important technology, but it's, um, again, we're talking about sustainability. We're talking about performance. I can give you a 100% recycled content roof. I, it's 100% recyclable. That's made within 500 miles of the site. The only problem is it's made out of paper mache, and the first time that it rains, it won't work anymore. So it's all about being practical and people applying uh, common sense to, um, you know, acoustics are more important than the recycled content in the ceiling tile. Aesthetics are more important. So. Um, I think it's a mistake to think that architects and engineers are looking at sustainability credits as the only way of, of achieving um, uh, a goal. Um, okay, can we move on uh, to uh, one more question? Sure. Um, we do have one more. Just as a clarification, Brian mentioned that uh, he was actually referring more to um, the steel within the elevators c can be accessed versus the actual 24-hour 24 24 hour operation. Um, but just clarifying that up, we can go to question nine here. Um, I believe that's when we are on now. Um, right, and this this will this will be our, our last question. So, okay. um, because I, we've um, actually gotten through everything we we had hoped to. The uh, other questions were were. Um, um, or minor. So how can a MEP engineer address all their concerns and still support the overall sustainability program of a project, lead or other certification goal? And, and I think it's interesting in, in the way the question is phrased, it seems to imply that the MEP engineer's concerns are, are different or, or don't coincide with the overall sustainability program of a project, which I would think would be completely not the case. Uh, an, an MEP engineer is going to be looking to make sure uh, the systems that are designed are appropriate for the, the building and the use. Uh, they're, they're looking to improve uh, comfort and, and um, occupant safety and they're looking to reduce the energy use and provide better ventilation within the uh, within space and use less water. Uh, I, I think all of the, those sorts of things are absolutely in line with a sustainability program of a project rather than you know, contradictory to or in a different direction from sustainability. Right, if, if, if this question was saying, you know, for example, if, 
if um, someone wanted to have operable windows in a high-rise, but the mechanical engineer is saying, I'm really not going to be able to control the air, do you move to the solution where if a window is open, the, ME, the air conditioning in that room goes off, so you're not uh, air conditioning the, uh, the whole city, um, but 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 those aren't um, you know those aren't uh, counterproductive views. Those are the realities of um, looking at occupant comfort in in different ways, and so you can still uh, achieve those. Um, we're coming to the the end of our, our session, and again, I thank people for uh, listening in. Uh, Bob, uh, did you have any um, um, concluding thoughts, or should we wrap it up? Um, I would say that, uh, as a concluding thought, uh, again, I don't, I don't know necessarily that having an engineer as the administrator is uh, are, are mutually exclusive project roles. Uh, I think that you know having someone who's who's doing an engineer role on a project team uh, and and also acting as lead administrator can be complementary. Uh, you know, it, it's combined goal, combined purpose. So uh, I, I generally see uh, both financial as well as task uh, uh, similarities. And uh, what am I looking for here? Not symbioses, but um, symmetry, uh, synergies. Uh, right, and and I, you know, I'd like to. Um, thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. I can personally attest that uh, to your expertise. And if anybody wants to continue this conversation with uh, CSI or, or Bob Andrews, he's at AHA Consulting Engineers in, in Lexington. Uh, I'm sure Matt is going to remind the group that this session will be on the uh, sustainability page at, at CSI for the next 100 years. And um, <laughs> We will. I, I thank you again for attending. Um, well, thank you for asking me. I, I, I enjoyed myself. Thank you. Um, just, oh, I was just going to do some final reminders then to let everyone know, like Mark said, uh, the recorded presentation as well as the download of the slides from today will be available on the CSI website. You can just go to csinet.org slash sustainability. And additionally, keep in mind um, that the next month's call is tentatively scheduled for May 17th. I'll just remind myself that it's always typically the third Tuesday of the month uh, from 3 to 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so, Mark, if you have any final questions or else we can end it.